I'm cooling my heels in lunch detention, the junior high equivalent of solitary confinement. The room is drab. Me and the other rejects are sitting at these desks that look like voting booths. I know why I'm here. I'm here because of a pipsqueak named Brendan Del Platano. I'm here because I'm the big kid. And in a way, this is all because I wanted a trench coat. The best gift for my 13th birthday would have been to be David Boreanaz from the TV show Angel. <laughs> I had a veritable man crush on the guy, but it wasn't his incisive cheekbones or perfectly quaffed hair. It was that long, flowing coat of his. In terms of sci-fi and fantasy, the longer your coat is, the more badass you are. All the confident heroes from my favorite works don their trench coats like capes. Angel, Neo from The Matrix, Mulder from X-Files. I wanted the confidence they had, but I was an overweight, new-in-town kid with curly hair that looked like something a homeless clown would have. So I retreated to my room where I listened to Smash Mouth and read comic books. I loved my comics, especially the really pulpy, morally dubious ones. All that good guy wrong stuff, that was for me. Two weeks before my birthday, my mom and I drove to an outlet mall where I promptly flocked to the London Fog store. I tried one on and mom looked skeptical as the oversized khaki material draped around my feet. Pet, you look like a rectangle, she said. <laughs> you really want one of these? I didn't hear her so marveling I was at the mirror. This is so badass. <laughs> I wouldn't have even gotten to wear the coat to school since we had to wear uniforms, which my friends and I fucking hated. As a sort of nonviolent protest, we invented a game to help us scuff up our ill-fitting polos. We used a Powerade bottle cap as the puck and our feet as sticks, and we called it foot hockey. Brunch was only 15 minutes, and once that cap dropped, nothing else mattered. Rules were sparse, and points were tallied randomly. Kick the cap and don't scuff up my vans. It allowed us to exercise some adolescent rage angst instead of piercing things. We weren't the smartest. None of us made the cut into honors classes. And we weren't the most popular. That distinction went to the boys who lazed about on the grass quad and miraculously accepted hugs from girls like it wasn't an earth-shattering deal. <laughs> we were the outsiders, and we liked it that way. We were the kids who headbanged to Limp Bizkit, debated Star Wars minutia over cans of Cactus Cooler, and had sleepovers which amounted to marathon gaming sessions. And then Brendan Del Platano showed up. Brendan was the first friend I made in Southern California. He was small for 13, and his size gave him a weasel shape. We were pretty close for about a year, but one day he stopped talking to me. His return to our makeshift foot hockey rink surprised me, so I talked to him. Hey, he said, want to come hang out with me instead? If this were a Judy Bloom novel, I would have hesitantly said yes and then learned an important lesson by the end. <laughs> but it's not. I knew who my friends were. Nah, man, it's cool. I like these guys. Brandon looked shocked. These guys? These guys. Really. You know, if you stick with these guys, you'll never have a girlfriend. Even if Brandon and I didn't know the right words, these guys was the most accurate way to describe us. We were the outsiders. We were the different ones. And we were among the first group compared to Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, when they brought automatic weapons to Columbine High School. On April 20th, 1999, I just wanted to see if Korn made it into the top two on Total Request Live. <laughs> but when I got home, the TV hurled images of a high school massacre. Students crawling over chain link fences, kids with bleached hair and no fear sweatshirts bawling their eyes out, and grainy security camera footage of someone walking through a hallway with a gun. I couldn't look away. The shooters listened to shitty rap rock, like me. They spent a lot of time on their computers, like me. And they wore black trench coats, just like the one I'd been begging for. 
My friends and I knew things had changed. Before Columbine, we were left well enough alone, save for the occasional yard duty who would smile and wave. Now, foot hockey had a regular spectator in the form of Bill, a mustachioed, burly gentleman who had the calm but intimidating demeanor of an off-duty cop. After Columbine, we were banned from eating in back of the school. No students were allowed to have lunch anywhere except the quad. We tried to stick to a shadowy tree and continue our usual intense analytics of Pokemon biology. <laughs> but before, we were outsiders in a nerdy way. Now it felt like people thought we were an actual threat. My birthday came and went. I didn't get the coat, nor did I want it anymore. The May 31st issue of Time magazine ran the cover story, How to Spot a Troubled Kid. One of the main features was a centerfold style chart, which explained how disturbed your kid was based on their web browser history. <laughs> At the bottom of this list was hate group websites, which Klebold and Harris were known to frequent. But the second to worst, porn sites. I watched porn, which means, according to one of America's major news outlets, I was only one step away from being a troubled kid. We were still allowed to play foot hockey during brunch and even started to open up our circle, allowing a few seventh graders to join in. After a while, Bill, the yard duty, moved on, and we hoped it was a sign that things were returning to normal. Out of the corner of my eye one day, I noticed a small figure, Brendan. He looked remarkably less weasel-ish than before. For some reason, I felt bad for the guy. Hey man, you wanna play? I asked. That gay ass game, said Brandon, but after a second, yeah, all right. <laughs> we dropped the cap, game on. This little seventh grader, Tyler, had some skills and punted the cap right past Brendan and into the goal. You're a fucking dick, yelled Brendan, loud enough to make us stop playing. This gay ass seventh grader stepped on my hand. I did not, said Tyler, and, and if anyone's the gay ass, it's you. Brendan, small and fast, grabbed Tyler. They engaged in a middle school fight, shoving, name-calling, a lot of flailing. Brendan grasped the back of Tyler's neck and flung him. The kid's face connected with a metal pole. Brendan strutted away as Tyler clutched his forehead in pain. Tyler told his teacher where it got passed up to administration. I was summoned to the main office and sat across from a scowling assistant principal. What happened, he asked. Brendan threw Tyler into a pole, I say. Just Brendan, no one else. He seemed skeptical. Yeah, we were just playing foot hockey. It's a game. Fighting is not a game. Brendan told us it was a brawl. That foot hockey game is violent. Before I can protest, he hands me the lunch detention notice, tells me that my parents should expect a call. So here I am in lunch detention. I look around but don't see Brendan anywhere. I hope he got suspended. Detention is over. I have two minutes to slam back a cactus cooler. I see Brendan who is smiling this big douchey smile, the kind that makes you know he's going to grow up to be a failed DJ. <laughs> I ask him, they gave me lunch attention for what you did, you know, what did you get? His smile gets even bigger. Nothing. They just wanted to talk to me. I wanted so badly to fight this Brendan kid. I wanted to pummel his unblemished face until his lips looked like two fat slugs. I wanted to crush his larynx in my hands. I wanted to wear his teeth on a necklace. <laughs> but I thought of Klebold and Harris. I couldn't be like them. I couldn't be a troubled kid. I did the very unbadass thing and walked away. I went home and furiously typed three single spaced pages. I wrote the only thing I knew, a pulp fiction story like the ones in my comics. It was about this guy who goes to work one day but forgets something. Upon arriving home, he finds his wife fucking the gardener. He flies into a rage and promptly caves in the gardener's face. It was everything I wanted to do to Brendan, but couldn't. One person read this story, and although she'd been watching all the same Columbine stuff I had, 
all the news reports about disturbed teens and warning signs and how it was all the parents' fault, she still had the best reaction. I love the details, Pess. It makes me feel like I'm right there, my mom said, because she is fucking amazing. <laughs> she reminded me of why I like being different. I saw Brendan throughout high school. He was always bouncing among social groups. He grew his hair along and started listening to techno. The next week, he'd be wearing dicky shorts and black socks, then a trucker cap and snap button shirts. Cheesy as it may sound, I don't think he ever found a place that actually accepted him. A few years into high school, someone stabbed Brendan with a pencil. By this point, he had such a low reputation that a petition was circulated to get the kid who stabbed Brendan unexpelled. <laughs> I'd like to say that I had learned that being an outcast is an adolescent universality, like acne and creative excuses for all the tissues in the trash that I had become more sensitive to the plight of kids who didn't fit in, that I forgave Brendan and let it all go. But really, I signed it twice. Thank you. Rory Kelly.